Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the QOZ2 webinar. For many of you, I actually saw you uh, in New York City yesterday and had some wonderful meetings with investors one-on-one. -on -one. I want to do that. I get a lot out of talking to you uh, in person as well. And I learned a lot, um, one of which is many of you watch the webinars um, quite a bit. So thank you for your feedback and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is David Shear. I'm co-CEO of Origin Investments. And I'm here with David Welk, who has been my teammate and leader at Origin for over 11 years now. He also runs our equity acquisitions nationwide and our Charlotte office. Um, welcome, David. Thanks, Dave. And uh, he's also jumped on a plane after this. Uh, we're having our holiday party um, and our day of giving back uh, tomorrow. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing you in person, my friend. Um, we. And by the way, as an aside, he's paying me a fantasy football debt uh, tonight. I plan to run up a big dinner on him uh, here in Chicago. So looking forward to seeing you for that too. I'll be paying with a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we have a lot to cover today. Um, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about uh, macro market, the fund. I wanna update you on the fund itself. Um, we have quite a few questions that came in. And thank you. Please keep doing that. Send in the questions prior because what it does is it helps Dave and I and other team members um, frame the presentation so that we can try to answer those organically throughout. Um, a couple questions that we had, um, really they center around valuation and market conditions and how it relates to QZ2 fund performance. And so I'll try to address that and Dave will as well. Um, if you have questions, please send them to the Q&A box. Um, we try to really um, answer every single question you have. So don't hold back. Uh, we don't cherry pick. We, we answer them all. And if you want to be acknowledged, um, you know, please list your name. And if you don't, uh, you can be anonymous. Um, if you do list your name, we'll, we'll use your name, not last name, but first name when we answer. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump right in with the state of the market. Um, since the last uh, report, uh, a lot's happened really in all three of these areas. Um, I would say the, the theme of 2022 is rate of change. Um, change is a constant in investments, but the rate of change in 2022 has been remarkable um, really in, in all of these areas. So I'll start with interest rates. Um, interest rates started the year um, if you're on these webinars, when I say risk-free rate, I'm, I'm always referring to the 10-year note yield. Um, that's that's the most important, in my opinion, of, of um, the interest rate uh, areas to watch because our long-term financing is, is based on that. And to some extent, our capitalization rates are based on that too um, because capitalization rates or multiples on earnings would be based on the long-term assumption of a, of a terminal asset. Right, so it's less sensitive to the front end of the interest rate curves in the back. Um, interest rates have actually come down quite a bit um, in the last three weeks. Um, again, rate of change is remarkable. Um, three weeks ago, the 10-year note yield was 4.3. Um, as you know, we, we hedge our interest rates at origin, so um, that was not that, uh, it wasn't that, big of a deal or important to this fund, the rates were going up because they were, they were almost um, entirely hedged. But when interest rates go up, also other things happen that, that aren't uh, particularly good for real estate. And one is um, if you don't have really high growth, your capitalization rate will start to follow the interest rate. So in other words, the same thing that's happening in the stock market, um, tech stocks, other stocks, with their discount rates would start to happen in the real estate market. Um, and that reduces the terminal value of an asset um, at a fixed um, net operating income or EBITDA. So it's gone from 4.3 to this morning, it's 3.46. So on a percentage basis, that's over a 20% move in three weeks, um, just to give you an idea of what 2022 looks like. So. Where it goes from here, I don't know. Um, I actually, if, if you've made me answer the question, I think we've sort of found a range uh, between three to 
um, that feels like where we'll be. But you know, I it's a strange market, and what everything is um, trying to figure out. What everyone's trying to figure out is if 21 was is, is inflation transitory. Obviously, it wasn't. 22 is how long will inflation be here, right? And I can tell you that, um, and I'll segue into the next um, state of the market, which is construction. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll skip down to construction costs because this is more relevant to this inflation conversation. Um, construction costs uh, in 2020 and sort of Q2, Q3, Q4, and then all of 21 and Q1 of this year, were going up at a 15% annualized rate. Um, that's unprecedented, um, certainly in my career. Um, usually they go up three, four percent a year. And so what we've seen in the last, I would say, two to three months is they've stopped going up. And so for the first time in 20 months, they're not going up. My belief is that they're actually going to start coming down. Um, we're seeing indications of that. They're, they're sort of green shoots. It's small. But I believe what's going to happen is right now there's a decent amount of development in the pipeline, um, both in terms of home builders, for sale home builders, and developers uh, of multi like us. Um, but I don't believe there's a huge pipeline behind it. And I think that the, the subcontractors and GCs are, are going to start understanding that they don't, they don't have um, pricing power uh, going forward. We've already seen um, a very sharp correction in um, input pricing meaning um, cost of lumber, for example. Um, I haven't looked at it this morning, but it's been you know, plus or minus 400 a board foot. You know, six, six eight months ago, it was over 1,000 board foot. And, and so again, the theme is the rate of change. You know, this input was generally around 300 a board foot for years, and then it went to 1,500 a board foot, and, and now it's all the way back to, 400 board foot. So th these are very positive, um, I would say, indications that construction costs are headed in the right place. I'm not optimistic that construction costs will go down a lot. And the reason for that is there's just no historical precedent for that. Um, even in the Great Recession, they, they only went down three to five percent and then they rebounded back. Um, I do think there's an opportunity this time that it might be a little bit more of a correction back um, just because they've gone up so much that they have some room to run um, if they want to go down the other way. Um, so in, in my opinion, this is not even a firm wide opinion. It's mine. Um, I think construction costs will come in four to eight percent. It'll be more than what happened in the Great Recession. Um, but that's just my opinion. Could be wrong. Um, I don't feel particularly strong about it. But if you had to, if you made me answer the question, I, I would suggest that. So what are we doing about that? Um, we're redesigning projects to try to capture the, the portions of the supply chain that have come down the most. For example, um, if we had type one construction that was very heavy on concrete and steel, that hasn't come up, come down in price as much as lumber. So we would, you know, we would be redesigning that to, to create a podium with stick above it to try to capture those savings. Um, so those are some of the things we're trying to do um, portfolio wide. And then construction financing. Um, this this is sort of a two part answer. You know, on the short end, um, the Fed is still raising rates. Construction financing is almost always priced over SOFR, a spread over SOFR. So that hasn't really moved in the last month. Um, but what has moved is your long-term financing. Um, that's 50 to 60 basis points, less expensive than it was a month ago. Um, so that's a very positive trend. Um, but on the front end, you're, you're borrowing at a rate over SOFR. So that really hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, importantly, that would be for a three to four year period. So it doesn't affect your deal um, returns nearly as much as the long-term end. Next slide, please. So th these growth rates are taken directly from origin multilytics. Um, one of the really cool things about yesterday, and I plan on doing this more, um, meeting with investors one-on-one -on -one and when I go to cities, um, 
people want to learn more about multilytics. We talk about it a lot and, and you know, we're going to start doing full webinars on it uh, because we, we actually believe it's the best uh, intellectual property and rent predictive machine learning. Um, and so we want you to learn more about it. it. It's very central to our decision making now. Doesn't make decisions, but we listen to it because it's been incredibly predictive for the last two years. And if you think about the last two years, back to rate of change, being predictive in, in a market this volatile is is pretty important. Um, and, you know, if, if we were just chugging along at a slow rate of change, it wouldn't matter as much. Um, but what you should take away from this slide. It's actually very important, um, and I would focus on year one, um, because what we're suggesting is completely different than market consensus. Um, if you look at the leading rent predictive models, um, and I won't cite them, but many of you know they are, um, they're all predicting, you know, two, three, four, five, six percent rent growth next year. And our own intellectual property, Multilytics, um, is predicting negative rent growth next year. Um, negative 3.7 in Nashville, negative 0.5 in Atlanta, negative 10 in Jacksonville, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want to take you take out of this is a couple of things. One, um, hold us to this because I, I'm I'm almost certain we're going to be right um, about this versus consensus. And the other thing you should think about is. Um, this isn't alarming to us. Um, we've been using this data for the last 12 months. This isn't something we woke up yesterday and said, oh no, you know, rent, there's gonna be negative rent growth. Like we we've understood and been making decisions based on this. And the properties you own in this fund are reflective of a negative rent growth environment, and it still meets our return expectations. So, you know, a lot of the themes I got from the questions. Uh, email prior are some form of interest rates are higher, the economy is slowing, um, cap rates are higher. You know, where is the portfolio? Are you going to mark the portfolio down? All the questions. And, and my answer is, you know, when we were looking at this portfolio um, a year and a half ago, or even two years ago, because a lot of these deals we've been working on for a long time, we were pricing to plus or minus a 40% margin. And if you, you know, if you if you can pull up some of the webinars from way back then, we would talk about that. Like, wow, the margins are really high. Typically, they're 25 to 30 in this industry. Now they're 40. You know, this is an amazing time. And that was true. And and what's happened because you know the cap rates are higher and um, construction costs are higher and rents are higher, but maybe not higher enough relative to the other inputs. You know, I would say the margin has gone from 40 to 30 but you're still at a very, very healthy margin. So in other words, some of the questions that I, I received were, you know, would you write down the fund um, in value? And, and my answer is we would, but there's no reason to do it. Um, if, if I'm an investor in this fund, a 30% margin means you're, 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 you're creating a tremendous amount of value through the development, even at these negative rent assumptions, even at these higher, construction costs, even at these higher interest rate costs. That's because, I mean, and I, I don't want to beat our chest, but I will a little bit. We're really good at what we do. And we're really conservative in our underwriting. And, you know, people who made a decision to invest here a year and a half ago or a year ago or six months ago, you made a really good choice. I mean, if you, had, if you what else could you have done where you'd still be protected, protect and grow? I mean, we're still there. And so, you know, I'll always be a straight shooter. And if we change and, and, and conditions continue to erode, we'll share it with you. Um, but right now, what's happened is you had an extraordinary margin expected value fund. It's still great, but it's a little bit lower than it was a year and a half ago. Um, but I still believe that it's up in value relative to the basis of where you are, even given these new conditions. Um, the last thing I would say is, when you look out past year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, what you're left with, and then the weighted average is just the weighted average of those, those numbers, um, you're left with healthy rent growth. You know, our, our models, you know, most of our development models use between two to 3% rent growth. 
you know, we, we do it different ways and we base it on our own multiletics. But, um, you know, if you look at the far right, that, that's where you're getting. You're just getting there through a negative year one and then it normalizes. And if you want to kind of get above the, the, the data and um, think about why, the reason why would be these are all really strong growth markets. These are places people want to live. Um, so demand will remain. Um, and then in terms of supply, there's a lot of supply. And I get this question a lot, too. Um, there's a lot of supply hitting Austin. You know, I'm scared. There's a lot of supply hitting Nashville. I'm scared. It's some form of the question. And that's actually true. There is a lot of supply, but it's this year. And then behind it, there's very, very little because interest rates are high, because construction costs are high, because capitalization rates have gone higher. You know, equity and debt isn't um, financing as many deals. And so as you look out into year two, three, four, and five, it, it's reflective of a world where there actually is undersupply, and there will be. Um, and by the way, not just of multifamily, but of for sale homes. And so we're, we're already undersupplied in housing. It's about to get a lot worse. And so that's not necessarily good for buyers of homes or, or renters, but it's actually really good for us, you know, people who are developing and owning multifamily long-term. Um, we'll have an undersupplied market um, that it's going to be exacerbated by what's happening um, right now um, because there's there's not enough new construction that, that's in the pipeline for 23, 24, 25. Next slide, please. So let's uh, transition into the fund itself. Um, the reason, um, so let me just answer, uh, I had two questions about the, the total size of the fund and when we'll stop raising. Um, so we have a cap on the fund at 300 million. Um, we've raised uh, actually 231 million. I just got that figure um, this morning as of today. And um, the date at which we can't and won't accept new capital is um, December 31st, 2023. So essentially we have a year more to raise. Um, and then if we hit 300,000 or 300 million, sorry, it'll be um, much sooner than that. Um, the reason we have a, a, a target number of fund assets is, um, and this kind of applies to every deal in this fund, except one that we've broken ground on, the deals that we're looking at, we're still underwriting, right? So like, even though we're, do, we're spending pre-development dollars, um, it doesn't mean that we'll do the deal. And, and you should actually feel good about that, not bad about that. And, and we have a precedent for this. So we need to build to a 30% margin. And if we're going through underwriting and variables are changing and we can't get there, um, we won't do it. And we'll say, okay, um, you know, rather than spend $20 million more to move forward, we'll, we'll take a loss on the three or 400,000 we spent. Um, it's, it's a dead cost and, and we'll walk away. Um, and, you know, we'll absolutely do that. So you should know that as an investor. Um, I get this question a lot too. Why are things delayed? Things are delayed because um, the market's moving very quickly in a lot of directions. And we won't start a project unless it makes sense. Um, and so a lot of times when we're delayed, we might be um, re-engineering the project. I, I mentioned an example uh, earlier where we're taking it from type one to uh, you know stick over podium to try to save millions of dollars to try to try to recapture that margin, right? And then the the name of the game when you do that is you have to create a design that even though it's cheaper in cost, it'll still have the same um, value. For the for the renter, they'll still want to pay similar pricing, um, and so that that's that's a process, and it takes four to six months uh, when we decide to do that. Um, so there there's a couple of sites we're doing that on, for example, and maybe maybe Dave will speak to that. Um, so yeah, 231 raised to date, 300 million hard cap. Um, we have another year to get there. 10 to 14 deals. Um, that's reflective of our pipeline, but also the uncertainty that even when you're in the pipeline, we're constantly reevaluating the deal to make sure that it meets our margin before we really hit um, the go button. And the go button is when we 
take out construction and financing, lock in the GMP, the general maximum price contract with our builders, um, and proceed with the funding of equity. Um, and so as we do that, we'll update you. Um, but there's a lot of deals that are before that stage right now. Um, next slide, please. So the net asset value, um, $161 million. We're keeping the um, the share price um, at 10, and we will throughout the raise. Um, I mentioned this before, but if we were to float the share price, um, which we don't do via the PPM, that, that's not how it works, but if we did, it would float higher. So like for those that were wondering if it would float lower, um, it wouldn't. Um, there's been value created relative to our basis, even in the conditions today. Um, and then you have a geographic summary on the right. Um, we're heavily weighted towards Georgia, Tennessee, um, Colorado, obviously, and Florida, all markets that we believe in. Um, Dave may speak to this, but we're speaking to uh, one of our um, best partners, Graystar, today about a deal in Las Vegas um, that we're, we're pretty excited about. Um, it would be our fourth deal with Graystar, um, all in QOZs. Um, so that's a deal that likely will, you'll see in the pipeline um, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you an, uh, an idea of um, the deals that we're working on. Um, again, most of these deals are in pre-development. Um, some of these deals we've purchased the land, like Edge Hill Commons, we've purchased the land. Um, but others we haven't. And um, what you see in the, in, the, in the middle is our return on cost, which averages, if you go to the bottom, 6.08. Um, right now, uh, cap rates, you know, I just had this conversation at a conference uh, with a bunch of folks, but I'll give you a range. Uh, and these are actual deals we see in our markets. Uh, cap rates are anywhere from 3.9% to 4.3%. That's what we see actually trading. There's not a ton of trades, uh, but there's enough that it's real. You know, there's a half billion dollars of trades that are within that range in our markets in the last few months. Um, so, you know, if, let's just go to the high end and past it and say four and a half cap. Um, you know, if you're at a four and a half cap and you're building to a six, like those numbers work. Right. So that's if you if you take four and a half and 30 percent of that and add it, you're obviously not to 608. And, and so we still feel good about the portfolio. Um, but like I said before, you can do the same math and say, well, it's not 40. That's right. That's what I said earlier. It used to be 40. Right. So we're not immune to market conditions. We're really good at what we do. We've protected and we've grown um, your NAV, even in a difficult market. But I can't maintain a 40 margin in the in the environment we're in right now. Um, but I can maintain a 30, um, and and we'll keep you updated. Um, that that's that's where we are today. And I would tell you you should feel very good about that, not bad about that. Um, the other thing is these numbers price in the negative rent growth that we expect next year. Um, and I believe will happen. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're the first manager, real estate manager to say this, and I'm saying it on a webinar today that we believe there'll be negative rent growth next year. And we also are already and have been underwriting to that all year. Um, and then the stress test, you know, it's important to know um, what happens as variables go further against you. So I mentioned the four and a half cap relative to the cap rate we're building to. Well, what would happen if it went to four, seven, five? What would happen is your, your multiples look like a 1.66. Um, that's over, that assumption there is over a five-year hold. So, you know, again, you're making, you're not only protecting your wealth, you're also growing it. You know, a 166 multiple over five with all of these variables going against you is probably pretty good. Um, I'm guessing the stock market's down 35% at that point. 
Um, so you have to kind of look at this on a relative basis. And then the last is, you know, how much would rent have to decline before I actually would just lose money? And, and there's your answer, right? 20%. So as an investor, then you have to kind of think, well, what does 20% mean? And what 20% means is that would be a, a rent decline we've never seen in real estate ever, ever. Over a two year period, three year period, four year period, five year period, keep going. It's never happened. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. I'm just trying to give you an idea of how remote that is. Um, and, and that isn't losing your money, that's break even. That's when you would actually not have a return, but you would still have preservation of equity. Um, so I don't, is that my last slide, Dave? Uh, yeah, I think that's it, Dave. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. He's gonna go over uh, two deals in detail in the pipeline, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, I already see we have a bunch, so uh, looking forward to it. Thanks, Dave. And just to highlight too, the, the multiples you were quoting do not incorporate the tax benefit. I know that there's a number of questions that, that did come up regarding returns and whether or not the fact the tax benefit is factored into that. So just a quick clarification, but um, uh, happy holidays to you all. Uh, hopefully uh, the season's off to a great start. Um, and as Dave mentioned, I am excited to get up to Chicago to break some bread with him and Tom Briney and celebrate your fantasy football prowess, Dave, as much as it pains me to admit that. But uh, And also toast to what has been a great year for the Origin team, uh, despite all the headwinds that Dave has just mentioned. Um, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting time in the market over the last 60 to 90 days. And, and I can say that uh, after you know being in the business now for 20 years, it's it's been one of the most dynamic 90-day periods, quarters that I've seen, frankly, um, over over that 20 year period so um as dave mentioned i'm going to focus on a few pipeline deals uh and then provide some highlights on one of our deals that's under construction which is elon rio grand uh located in colorado springs uh one of the deals that dave mentioned uh in partnership with graystar as well as our newest fund asset rise in st augustine uh which closed just a few weeks ago in november um, overall, pipeline activity has been slowing a little bit in the past quarter, um, but we still do maintain a really active pipeline that could likely fill out the remainder of the fund over the coming months. Uh, and Dave touched on a lot of elements um, that we are vigilant in the marketplace that we're underwriting, uh, notably on cost. Uh, he did mention that we're seeing a lot of leveling in the marketplace. In a few cases, notably in Texas and in Florida, we're actually starting to see some declines in, in not you know, substantial really, but as, as he mentioned, you know, green sheets are starting to show and we're seeing declines somewhere in the cases of one to 3%. Um, right now, we haven't really seen that uh, manifest in other markets uh, beyond the two that I mentioned, but we believe over the course of the year for the reasons they've mentioned, we will see more. Um, we're also in our new underwriting for these pipeline deals, as Dave mentioned, we're factoring in the negative rent growth. Uh, as shown on the slide and as Dave discussed, this is not something new that we've incorporated in the last 30 to 60 days, where the rest of the market is now seeing what we forecasted in February of this year, which is three consecutive months of rent clients. And as and Dave was touching on this to a degree, but yeah, historically, October, November, December have been seasonal months, and we've seen declines uh, in the marketplace. And then the rest of the year, you're starting to see you see growth historically. Uh, beyond that, uh, we're seeing what we believe to be uh, above normal seasonality declines, and we continue to, to incorporate that into our underwriting. Uh, and the last uh, element in the marketplace on fundamentals that we remain vigilant on is land pricing. Uh, in our deals. And we haven't seen a significant decline in land values yet. Uh, and we don't really expect to see a lot in Texas. Uh, and that's really because land values in Texas, uh, to begin with, didn't see the same run up as uh, land values in Arizona and Colorado and the Southeast, in particular in Florida. And that's uh, to get nuanced, that's really a, a function of just the higher taxation 
in Texas. So therefore land can't appreciate as much because um, you're still trying to maintain a, a, the development margin that, that Dave mentioned. So something that we're keeping an eye on, but we feel really confident about the land basis that we've been able to uh, put all of these deals under, under contract at. They felt very, very insulated at the time. And even still with the repricing the land, we still have significant margin in our land basis. Uh, so to talk about the pipeline here, which is a dynamic, um, deals come in and go within this pipeline um, over you know, certainly in the course of, of 30 to 60 days. Um, but we've got five assets in the pipeline currently totaling about 1,700 units. Uh, and it's a variety of product. It's built for rent, which the, this fund already has two actually three of those assets, and I'll cover the third uh, in, in St. Augustine here shortly. Um, but we've got other deals in the pipeline, which is a product that we're frankly really excited about. We think it's it's perfectly paired within the OZ timeline and whole period. Um, and then we also have a number of conventional surface park projects in a well-diversified, as you can see on the map here, a number of, of uh, pin placements in Charlotte, Charleston, Nashville, Orlando and Phoenix. Uh, in total, it's about half a billion worth of development costs across those five deals and about 164 million of total equity need. Uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about one of our existing assets in the in that's under construction, the portfolio. Um, this is Elon Rio Grande, which is located in downtown Colorado Springs. Uh, this is a 207 unit, seven story class A podium project. Dave talked a little bit about podium, you know, with wood frame um, versus, you know, concrete podium. This is an example of a wood frame deal um, that has uh, a, a concrete podium component to it. Also in partnership with, with Graystar, this is our third OZ development project in downtown uh, with Graystar. It's located adjacent to OZ Fund One's uh, Ensley and shares the same benefits in the location um, that really got the, uh, us excited about that project initially. Um, just as a note, because this is, again, our third project and we've taken a large position in downtown Colorado Springs, which, by the way, holds up quite well in our uh, uh, rent forecast. It shows very limited fall off um, you know, due to recessionary pressures. But the benefit we're going to have with this, having a third project here is we're generating some real operational efficiency in the marketplace. Uh, when you have that type of scale, you can spread a number of your fixed costs ac across uh, those assets and really helps benefit. So this, this project uh, certainly will see some benefit from uh, our investments in, in OZ Fund One and both Ensley and Fiona. Uh, and similar to those two projects, this also benefits from a TIF provided by the city of, of Colorado Springs. Um, it's a 65% reduction in taxes for 15 years. So just to clarify, this, this is a double uh, benefit here in taxation. We're getting a benefit at the project and property level on our property taxes, and then investors get additionally benefit, get additional benefit on their federal income taxes. So uh, love pairing uh, the double benefit of property tax abatements along with um, the DOZ uh, benefits. Uh, so this total taxation value over the life of the project is about 2.3 million of support provided by the city. Um, as you can see uh, from the photos here, um, site work is underway. Actually, the entire origin team was out in Colorado Springs for our retreat in September. So it was pretty fun because we got to all throw on some hard hats and construction vests and go walk all three projects. Um, in fact, that first photo or the second slide that uh, Dave was talking to was a picture of managing director Tom Briney, uh, who heads up our, our Denver office and sourced all these deals along with our controller Priya as they were walking our Fiona project. So um, uh, nice little shout out there. But as shown in the photos, we've had some really good progress here in the site work um, where we've completed our grading and poured our, our concrete foundations um, happy to report that the project remains on schedule and on budget, uh, and we've got a, a very large contingency here um, that we haven't even touched yet. Uh, and in fact, we actually anticipate seeing upwards of 400000 in savings from our uh, price decline 
Dave touched on the lumber market declines. Uh, we're, this project is actually a beneficiary of that. When we went to our, our GMP in, I believe it was July, we were around peak lumber then, and we've seen it retreat. He was right on. I did check this morning. It's, it's, it's around 400 bucks a board foot. So we've seen pricing really come down and, and benefit the project. And this one, again, is, um, is going to see almost a half million of savings. Uh, last slide for me will be the, the uh, New Deal highlight of the Rise St. Augustine project. Uh, this just closed right around Thanksgiving, so a couple of weeks ago, um, and talk about programmatic partnerships with Graystar, um, which we're, we're very uh, fortunate to have a deep line with them. Rise, um, we actually even have more underway with them, very valued partner out of Jacksonville. Uh, I actually believe this is our sixth partnership with them. Uh, they're based in and actually in Jacksonville and have a, a presence in Valdosta, Georgia as well. Um, but they're a vertically integrated developer, general contractor, property manager. So um, they certainly able to control uh, a lot of the elements of the project and operations as well. Uh, specific to this project, this is a 272 unit built for rent community. So I mentioned uh, this is the third uh, BFR community in the portfolio, in addition to our two AVA projects. Uh, the site here is located about two miles from historic downtown Jacksonville, so great location. Uh, that downtown St. August, sorry, downtown St. Augustine uh, has a uh, great collection of, of historic architecture, um, real quality bars and restaurants and amenities. Uh, so not far from there. And being able to live in this type of community that close to downtown and in an otherwise urban environment is pretty unique for the area. Um, it'll benefit from the St. John's County Schools, which are the top rated school, it's the top rated school district in the state of Florida. Uh, the, and the project itself here will be a collection of two-story townhome units uh, comprising two in, of two and three bedroom units, about 1,600 square foot in size. Um, and so we believe that this product itself is going to really attract a wide array of target hunters and profiles uh, who want that, uh, you know, share, not, no one living above and below you, but shared walls. Also, we'll have a, a class amenity package in direct access garages. So a lot of flex flexibility for the renter here uh, who wants a professionally managed community. Uh, but again, doesn't want to live in conventional projects. So uh, we anticipate the uh, groundbreaking to occur here in late first quarter, early second quarter, just waiting on finalization and receipt of permits um, from St. John's County. So um, excited for this one and, and really excited, frankly, to, to expand our partnership with, with RISE. Um, so that, I believe, concludes my portion of it. Dave, I think we're on to the Q&A at this point. Thanks, Dave. We get a lot of questions about build for rent too. Um, people are excited about it. They wanna know if we're involved and the answer is yes. We've been looking at build for rent for about five years now and we have a lot of build for rent in our pipeline. You've seen one here, but there'll be a lot to follow. Um, the, the reality is there's just a lot of people that wanted to buy homes and they can't um, because home prices went up too much and mortgage rates were too high. And build for rent uh, allows them to emulate home ownership without buying. Um, you get a attached garage or parking, you get a backyard. Um, and so it, it's very, very different and a different offering um, that I think will capture a lot of demand. The other thing I would add to the Colorado Springs story, um, it's very interesting that we're layering on city incentives with QOZ. You know, that'll help the returns. But none of that matters if there's not a lot of demand. And in Colorado Springs, there's just enormous demand. Um, the city is offering incentives because they don't have enough housing. Um, all the housing stock downtown is 80s built. Um, and so we're, we're going to be the largest owner in Colorado Springs um, very, very quickly. Yeah, we'll get scale. Uh, but, you know, there's waiting lists at apartment buildings in Colorado Springs. So that's, that's what really excites us there. Um, all right, so we we have a bunch of questions. Um, Dave, I'll steer and uh, I'll I'll send the questions your way as well. Um, 
So here's an interesting question. Um, it's anonymous. Are you seeing restructuring of QZ projects? I made an investment, um, but the developer never got permits. What happens to an investment like this? Um, I am not seeing deals like this at this point, um, but you're obviously in the field with your teams. What do you think? Yeah, I actually heard of um, a deal last week. It was in uh, not a market that we invest in. It was in Baltimore. Um, so, but but yes, I have. I mean, permit delays are are very real, and it depends on the market. But growing by the day, um, you know, Phoenix has been a challenge in our markets. Charlotte is even growing, so we're making proactive steps to. Uh, um, ensure that we're filing as early as possible to obtain our permits. But to answer your question, um, I've, it's really only been a handful of deals and frankly, not really, I haven't heard of any in, in our markets yet. Doesn't mean that we won't see those, but um, it's been New York, it's been Baltimore um, markets that we don't invest in. Yeah, I, I would change the question. Um, if you're an investor in an OZ deal, not, not our fund, but another, I wouldn't worry about a delay. I would worry about people proceeding at thin margins. And that that's really the biggest risk is, you know, why would we do the right thing? Well, first of all, that, that's what we do. And we have a track record of 15 years of doing that. But secondly, you know, Michael and I are the largest investors in QOZ1. Um, we're huge investors in QOZ2. Like, that's what alignment means. Like, we are aligned with you. Why would we pursue deals that don't have good margins? It makes no sense. Um, if you're in a deal with a developer that isn't aligned with you, um, that would be different. Maybe they will start because they get a fee if they start. And, you know, if margins are less than 30, and that's the difficult part. If you're an investor that isn't trained in finance and real estate and inputs and defensible and all these things, like, I, I don't even know how you'd know what the margin is on a deal like that. And, and that's, that's the worst risk. It's not a delay. It's proceeding when they shouldn't. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. Lots of questions about QZ law. Um, the answer is we don't know. My, my partner, Michael, um, you know, he's been talking more with consultants who are um, and lobbyists. Um, I'm not involved in that, but my understanding is um, it has a lot of bipartisan support. It's going to happen. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, but I would also say, as an adult that's seen politics for a long time, it's not done till it's done. And it isn't done. And so I, I wouldn't invest in QOZ because this is a definite thing to happen. I would invest in QZ because it fits your risk return and, and tax strategies. And if they do extend the program, it'll provide even more benefits um, if that happens. But I can't tell you for sure that it will. Um, it seems to be very likely that it will, but I don't have new information. Um, I'm going to give you one, Dave. Um, would you consider reducing leverage um, to deals right now? That's an interesting question. Um, it's kind of funny because whether you're considering or not, the bank's making you do that. <laughs> so it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like maybe you can speak to that. No, I mean, I would answer the same way. Um, we're, we're being forced to reduce leverage. Um, and, and frankly, we, we would still use 60, 65, um, and in 60s, it, you know, we're still finding um, that as a leverage ratio that we can obtain in the market. It's getting more difficult by the day. I'd say historically, 65 was was right in our sweet spot. Um, I've heard in the last two days, this for the second time, the of banks issuing 47% LTC term sheets, um, which I don't know why there seems to be this. Uh, magic number of 47, um, but that is exceptionally low leverage. And, and oftentimes what groups are doing is they're pairing that with some sort of MES or preferred equity, which we're very well versed in and are pretty active in our through our income plus fund. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we are being forced to do it um, in, in our projects. So I'd say it, to use a number right now, today, we're 55 to 60. And, and historically 65. Um, do we go lower than that next year? 
don't know. Um, but that's that's the settlement at the moment. Okay, um, thank you. So I'm gonna take Paresh's question. Thank you for your question. Um, what is the occupancy assumption on the slide showing stress features? Um, Paresh, that's 95%. Um, that's the standard used in multifamily for the last 20 years. So we're not deviating from that there. Um, it's also about where it is today. Maybe it's a little bit higher than that today. Um, yeah, another question, Hector, thank you for your question. Um, is there any reason why rent growth in Tampa Bay is negative in year two? The other markets are positive. Um, I'll give that to you, Dave, because um, you know, you're really heading along with Phil and our data scientists that that technology. So why is Tampa um, negative in year two? Yeah, the, uh, part of the reason why is um, the hyperbolic nature of both Tampa and Phoenix to pick on those two because they're the, they are the, the highest two rent growth markets that we've seen in the country in the last two years. Um, they went up so far and so fast. So both of those market are up, markets are really up about 40% in the last two years. So uh, as I tell folks, you know, when we, when I say, you know, we're forecasting negative rent growth and, and, you know, somewhat severe on a relative basis in markets like Tampa and Phoenix. And the question I was, is, well, how much, you know, and, and I'm saying, well, it depends on, on the, you know, the, the market, some market, um, some are down 10, some are down 15. And it sounds scary. Um, but you have to put it into context and perspective. I mean, sorry, not sorry, when it went up 40% in two years and it goes down 10. Um, so you're still way, way above historical norms. In term so if you pick those markets and you do see a decline, you're still way out uh, performing your forecasts when you went into those deals uh, using a more historic convention of three to 4% rent growth. So I, I believe what's happening here in Phoenix, or sorry, in Tampa, is that you're seeing some additional trail off in uh, rent declines because we had such a steep increase there. Um, and it, it hits a little bit harder than Phoenix because Phoenix is a little bit more diversified of an economy. But that's really, I think, the, it's you're just seeing more residual fall off in, in Tampa. It's also a function of supply. You know, supply is something that's known and we can, you know, that's publicly declared. So it goes into our models. And um, if there's more supply in the market that needs to work through, it, it'll take longer for rent growth. There's a short term and a long term supply. We're, we're under supplied long term, certainly in these markets. But if there's a lot of supply coming in the next month, two months, a year, et cetera, there could be short term headwinds to rent growth, but, but not long term. So I'm sure Tampa is is having to deal with that in the model as well. Um, Dave, I'm going to do three questions quickly, and then uh, you can sign us off. Um, does that make sense? Sounds good. Um, and the reason I'm I'm doing this quickly, I actually have a meeting at noon. I have to drive to, so um, apologize. But we did cover, I believe, all the questions. Once I do this, um, so. An anonymous question, um, when are we going to float NAV? Um, the answer to that is um, it'll be after the raise period. And so that would either be when we raise 300 million, because that's the cap, or the end of um, 2023. So it, it isn't a date because we might hit the cap before that. Um, and then we'll start floating NAV. Um, and that's Another monthly, uh, Dave, or quarterly? This That was a question on frequency. That'll be done uh, quarterly, you know, because we report out quarterly uh, on our funds. Um, the only the only fund that's done NAV-based monthly, um, actually there's two, would be the two funds that, that pay out monthly. You know, one is income plus and the other is multifamily credit. Um, okay, so... Uh, I guess there's some new questions, so I might have to not answer them all. Um, what has been raised to date for QZ2? 231 million um, has been raised to date. 
Uh, Kenny asked a question for the five year market rent growth by market table. I have two questions. Are those numbers for single family built or for rent homes? It's for rent homes. We don't do, it's only rent. Um, it's not condos. It's not in for sale. Five year average, how's it calculated? I found it's neither arithmetic nor geometric. I'm not sure, Kenny. Um, it, it says weighted average. Our investment management team did that. So you can email me at david at origin investments and we'll get you the backup of how that average was calculated. Um, thanks for your question. The forecast of distribution. This is a great question uh, by Uday. Thank you, Uday. Can you provide information and context? Um, so this is really, really hard for us to forecast because interest rates are changing so quickly. And the amount we can refi out is a function of the debt service, which is a function of the interest rate at the prevailing time. Um, normally, I, I would be comfortable in a normal market condition saying, you know, this is the range. But as I said, you know, in my opening comments, the, the risk-free rate has moved 20% in the last three weeks. So I actually, I'm not comfortable giving you that type of um, forecast. I don't know. Um, based on what's happening right now. It could be that it's a, a significant distribution. It could be that it's a very small distribution. It could be that it's no distribution. And I apologize. I wish I could um, give you something tangible, but um, these are things that aren't in my control um, at this point. I, I can't control where interest rates will be in three or four years. Um, so we'll keep you updated as we get closer. Um, we'll have more certainty and we'll start giving you more visibility. But if if I were an investor, um, I would not be planning at this point for liquidity to pay your tax liability in 2026. It's likely to happen, but it might not happen. And it's a function of where interest rates will be at that point. Um, Dave, do you want to take one? Um, I'll give you one. Um, Jennifer, you had an interesting comment on Columbus. Um, you're right. We do run AI nationally. In fact, for um, for our uh, multifamily credit fund, we're buying multifamily loans nationally, so we leverage that technology everywhere. Um, but obviously, we're not for QOZ. We don't cover that market. Um, I have heard very positive things about Columbus, um, but we don't cover it. Um, but thanks for your for your note on that. Dave, I can take the question on lumber. <clears throat> um, the, the question from anonymous oh, yeah. was the four hundred yeah, thousand savings. Yeah, we saw at the Elon Rio Grande project. Are you tying to major raw materials in indices um, for lumber? Uh, that that is generally and has been for the last twenty months a pure allowance, and so all no general contractors are willing to go to what's known as a guaranteed maximum price contract. Uh, for lumber, um, just given the volatility in that market. So we have chosen instead to uh, take the risk and we knew we saw the futures market trending in our direction. Uh, therefore, we had to close the loan with an assumption. We padded it, those assumptions uh, and, and, the, and lumber pricing has gone our way. And that's one example. We've seen in some cases, millions of dollars of savings um, from where the index was from uh, project closing to battle. The rest of the raw materials are, are generally lumped into a, a guaranteed maximum price contract with our general contractors. So we're pushing risk onto them. Uh, a few exceptions here and there, but that's generally the case. So um, I'll just add to that a little bit. We we spent a lot of time researching hedging raw materials. Um, there's two ways to do it. You could buy cash raw materials. You could buy the lumber at this pricing and store it. There's a lot of problems with that. Um, there's a cost of storage that increases your basis on the lumber. And there's also degradation of the lumber. The longer you store it, the more it can uh, become spoiled and not usable. And, gen and then there's also trans there's transportation costs because you're having to, to, to move it to storage and then out of storage to the site. Um, so it generally is adding 10 to 15 percent. And the way that I view the world, and, and I think you would agree, Dave, 
Um, we don't know if lumber's going up or down. So starting anything up 15% doesn't feel great. Um, I would rather um, not do that. The other thing I would say is um, unlike interest rates, which you can hedge efficiently, um, I believe that input costs are actually counter hedged by the value of the asset itself. And so if, if raw materials are going up in price, it's because demand is creating more supply for the asset and the value of the assets are going up, i.e. last year. And the reverse is true too. So if you were to hedge lumber and have it go through you, now it's trading 300, you're losing on your hedge. It's likely that assets are also going down. So you're, now you're losing twice. Um, so I, I don't really like the notion of hedging raw materials. Um, obviously, if you buy it and they go up, you're happy, but it's not efficient. Um, and then the last thing is you, you can hedge it in the future market. We've looked at that too. The problem with that is it's very thinly traded. It's at the CME. Um, and we really wouldn't be able to hedge more than a couple million dollars. Um, and so if you think about that, a couple million dollars, and that's because the, the contracts are small and they're thinly traded, we would um, overwhelm the market. Um, we need millions of dollars per deal. So we don't need to hedge 2 million. If we were going to do it, we need to hedge 30 million. Well, 30 million is, you know, 5x the lumber open interest. I mean, we would, there's no way to do that. Um, so I'm giving you a flavor of how much thought is given into this. Um, we do think about all this um, constantly and some of the things we hedge and, and some we don't. Um, you know, we did get, and I should answer this because it, it's related. Um, on the interest rate side, there's questions about how we allocate the profits of our hedges. And that was done before we put the hedges on um, because each, each fund has developments and assets. Um, and if they're not on fixed debt, um, we were allocating them pro rata with what the need was. Um, and so there's, there's a formula to that. Um, I don't believe the person, uh, this was emailed in prior, but David at Origin Investments, if, if you want to see how we do that, I'm happy to share it. Um, there's also been a lot of questions, and I should address this, I probably should have done it in the beginning, about valuation. Um, and it, it's, it's a question we hear a lot. Um, we just published our valuation policy for Income Plus Fund. We're getting questions about how we value QZ. Um, we have a policy for valuation for QZ too as well. I just reviewed it. Um, it's based on the discount rates during development and the margin. And so we talked about the margin. It's right around 30% right now, but we haven't built the deals. So as the deals become more and more complete, you're more and more through that idea of capturing the 30% margin. And i um, happy to share that as well. Um, David at Origin Investments, um, we can share it with every investor in the fund or those that are interested. Um, but the short answer is yes, we have a valuation policy for every fund. Um, and this one is no different. Um, Dave, the last question I believe was about um, when you joint venture is there and, and I want to find his name so I can acknowledge it. Um, oh, Jonathan's question? Yes, Jonathan. Thanks for your question. Um, he's asking about promotes if you have a joint venture. And obviously that varies deal by deal. Some of the deals we do are direct. Some were co-developer. Some were joint venture. Um, but, you know, please address that. Yeah, I'll do it quickly. I know you got to run. You're, you're already late for your meeting. Um, so the short answer is what Dave just said, right? We we have a lot of uh, different structures that we enter into with with partners. In some cases, we're sharing in the development fee and the promote um, and a co-development arrangement. And others, we are strictly an LP where we are providing a promote interest. And in the case of Rise, uh, yes, we are paying a promote. Um, which is structured in a programmatic fashion. So we feel that um, based upon the volume of deals that we're doing with Rise, that we we have a pretty uh, favorable structure. But you know, we certainly we are in the marketplace and are, are having to compete with other you know fund managers for deals in the market. So we're making sure that we're still uh, meeting meeting the market. Uh, and then in some cases, as Dave mentioned, we're 
either um, fee developing or doing them directly where there's no promote. So it just really varies on fund and, or sorry, investment and the corresponding uh, joint venture structure. Question about QZ Fund 3. Um, Want to make sure I have the name if they listed one second. ETA, that's anonymous. Um, we don't have an ETA, and I believe we'll have an e, uh, a QZ Fund 3. I said earlier, I think it'll come in conjunction with the extension of the program, too. So there might be even better benefits uh, because they'll bring back the 15%. Um, step up in basis on the original capital gain. Um, the other thing that I would remind people of um, is you don't have to exit QZ after 10 years. Um, I don't intend to do that. Uh, so I'm in QZ1, QZ2. You can stay in these investments until 2046 and it continues to compound tax-free. So I don't, I don't have an IRA. I wasn't... Um, educated and didn't understand the power of, of doing that when you were young. Um, so this is really my IRA. I, I get to compound this money for, you know, 26 years and, you know, in, in 2046, I'll be like 50, Dave. So, you know, I'll be right at my retirement age. <laughs> so no, I, I really like that component. Um, that, And then, you know, we had another question about segregation, cost seg. Um, thanks, Robert. Um, we do look at cost seg and we're, we're weighing the cost of the cost seg itself versus the um, accelerated depreciation. What's really interesting about QOZ is you get to depreciate the asset and there's no catch up. And that's just remarkable, right? Because usually depreciation is just a deferral um, and you ultimately, you, you have a zero basis when you sell the asset. So it's a higher capital gain. Here, there's no capital gain paid, so you get depreciated against income, but then there is no catch-up. So it's another, you know, rarely talked about uh, feature of QOZ. And as Dave pointed out, when we're talking about returns, we never incorporate any of these tax advantages. That's the added benefit for you to, to quantify. Um, Dave, you want to sign us off? I, I do think we've covered all of it. Yes, all of our, uh, Greg, last one, all multifamily projects we build are, are class A. Um, we do build suburban and urban. And so class A and suburban might be a stick products. Uh, class A and urban might be a podium product or a wrap product. But, but in all cases, we're trying to capture the higher end of the market with high quality construction. Yeah, I think this is going to be our last uh, QOZ webinar for the year. So wishing everyone happy holidays, uh, enjoyable and safe new year. Um, and Dave, looking forward to seeing you in a few hours tonight and uh, raising a glass. Yeah, Dave, like I said uh, earlier in the week, um, it's remarkable how consistently I beat you on these bets. Um, it's almost statistically impossible. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe I should be looking at some hedging. Uh, the same way we we concentrated on our lumber futures. <laughs> All right, we'll see you soon. Safe travels. Uh, see you. Take care. Bye.